Hi everyone. Today we are going to talk about aromaticity. And so for the first little bit, we're going to really dive into the structure of one aromatic compound in particular, benzene. So we've heard about it before. We've known it was special. It's kind of been on its own little pedestal. It's not like an alkene, but kind of. Uh, so we're going to unlock why that's the case, what's so special about benzene. You may want to build the model to prove to yourself, kind of get your mind around the 3D uh, implications of having alternating single and double bonds. It forces it to be planar, right? You've probably built a lot of models of cyclohexane rings in the past, chair conformations, remember those? Uh, so this is very, this is a six-membered ring as well, but notice that it's not um, going to bend. So we're going to be taking it a very close look at all the aspects of the electronic and structural properties of benzene and understand how they give rise to bulk properties, including applications for materials, but uh, bio uh, molecular applications and um, reactivity. So we got to start at kind of at ground zero and work our way up to understand that. So this is a very structure heavy chapter. Uh, reactions will come soon though. Okay, so we're not diving into reactions just yet. So a little bit, you can relax for a second before it gets too rigorous. The, I'm going to start off as a warm-up with a little bit of history about benzene, just because it is actually pretty interesting. It's a famous story. Uh, Kekulé, if you hear that name, it's pretty much synonymous with benzene in the chemistry world. Uh, that's the, his major discovery was the structure of benzene. Why is the structure of benzene so difficult? By NMR, mass spec, um, you would have figured that out very quickly. However, that wasn't available back when it was discovered. So they knew only the formula, C6H6. However, that has lots of isomers. So how did they arrive at the correct isomer that would account for its unusual stability? So they knew it was very stable. They knew it did not react quite like any other unsaturated hydrocarbon. And then they also knew uh, what its formula was. So how did they get it in a cyclic nature and how did they get uh, this proposal that it was delocalized, so in other words, conjugated um, across all the atoms in the in the ring. Well, it was an interesting uh, piece, famous story where Kekulé has, like a, I guess like any mad scientist would, uh, his eureka moment in his dreams. So I have the key part of the text there. I turned my chair toward the fire and dozed. Again, the atoms were gamboling before my eyes, long rows, twining and twisting in a snake-like motion. But look, what was that? One of the snakes had seized hold of its own tail and the form whirled mockingly before my eyes. As if by a flash of lightning, I awoke. I spent the rest of the night working out the consequences of this hypothesis. So in other words, he had a dream about a snake which I imagine, you know, you could stretch it out to be linear. And maybe perhaps, I'm just extrapolating here, that a lot of the proposed isomers he might have been, that were going around were linear uh, or acyclic in other words. Um, but then the snake bit its own tail and created sort of a cyclic animal briefly. And so benzene, um, it was thereby kind of his conclusion that benzene is a cyclic animal or beast in its own right. Um, not just that it's a cycle, but also that the, the pi bonds are arranged such that it's alternating double single, which allows that cyclical um, traversing of electrons. And in fact, he's um, famous enough to have appeared on a, not just your textbook, but postage stamp. Yes, I have a sort of a geeky hobby that I'll share with you to collect stamps, but not just any stamps. I like chemistry stamps. I think it's cool when they show up. Um, show up when a chemist is famous enough to show up to the whole world, not just the chemistry community. So this is an old stamp. It's actually just two of them, but I didn't want to separate them. So I framed them and they're in my office. That's the bookshelf they're on. Uh, so you get a chance to visit, I hope. Um, this is the benzene structure around his head. <laughs> and so there's no snake in this one, but if you look it up, you might see some pictures of snakes biting their tail if you want to read more about his dream. Um, but you could see the alternating double uh, and single bonds, All right? So that's, he made it onto a stamp and I'm, I'm a proud owner of the stamp. So anyway, interesting history, famous story. Now, as far as the actual structure goes, we're going to take some due diligence into 
looking at it more closely. It looks very simple and it actually is not, um, it's not terribly complicated. Yeah, I know, I'll get this library out of the way, here we go. Okay, so we have benzene, the way we've always been looking at it. And if we draw on all of the H's, we might see C6H6. Why am I doing that? I just want to highlight the bonds that are going on there. This is totally a review right now. Um, I hope you understand, have a good understanding of hybrid orbitals um, and atomic orbitals that were not hybridized, um, molecular orbitals, right? So, but I'm gonna go over it nonetheless because we have to, to be able to kind of go on and understand what's going on structurally. So take a look at the benzene sigma bonding framework that all happens in the plane. Remember sigma bonds overlap end to end. So they overlap like this. And so if you have sigma bonds, they're overlapping this way, not side to side. That's p orbital end to end is sigma bonds. And they're all in the same plane as the molecule as drawn. So here's our H's and they're using that spherical orbital because it doesn't hybridize. It only has an S orbital. If we zoom in a little more, we'll see that our, uh, I don't want to do that, our um, carbons are not using pure atomic orbitals, they're using hybrid orbitals for their sigma bonding framework. What are these carbons doing? These carbons each have an H attached. So let's go back and kind of look at that. They each have an H attached. They need a sigma bond to the H. They need a sigma bond to their other carbon, their neighbor carbon over here, hello neighbor, and they need a sigma bond to the carbon over here. They also need a pi bond to one of the carbons, one of the two carbons, pick any one. So it needs to use three sigma and one pi. So let's write that down. Three sigma plus one pi, that gives us a total of four bonds for carbon, as we know it makes. When we use three sigma plus one pi, what does that translate to in terms of hybridization? Remember how to determine your hybrid orbitals being used? You can make a list of all the orbitals available. Carbon's a second row element, so it only has access to S and three Ps, Px, Py, Pz. So you can even write that, it's not necessary. But we know we need three of those to be hybridized for our sigma. Always sigma bonds for carbon are gonna use a hybrid orbital and this needs a p orbital by itself. So let's reserve a p orbital for our pi bond. What's left over is what we're allowed to mix for hybridizing. That makes perfect sense because we have three orbitals. We need them for three bonds. You combine the three orbitals, you get, you get three new orbitals out. So I'm going to circle that. What's in my blue circle? sp2. And then I have the p, so that's, those are for my sigma bonds. I have the p, pure p orbital there for my pi bonds. That describes the orbitals that are being used by carbon and benzene. Now this sigma bonding framework, if I label all the sigma bonds, I'll use blue since I was doing it there, I of course have one between the hydrogen and the carbon. Notice they're not matching. H is using an s orbital, it's overlapping with one of the hybrid sp2 orbitals. So let's label that orbital. In fact, I'm going to label all three. I'll just pick on that carbon. It's using three sp2 hybrid orbitals because it needs to make three sigma bonds. Its fourth bond is a pi bond. So we'll cover that in a second. So I've labeled them all. I'm going to go around and make sure I labeled all my sigma bonds. Every time they overlapped, we have a sigma bond. So there's six sigma bonds between C's and H's. There's six sigma bonds for this making up the sides, right? For the CCs. Now, another representation you might see, and this is gonna get helpful. So this, this accounts for all of our sigma bonding framework. I'll write that right here. Framework. It's in the plane of the molecule as we drew it. So P orbitals are not in the plane. They're perpendicular, above and below the plane. So one lobe is above, the other lobe is below. So it 
it's hard to draw a pure book coming out at you. And that's how we draw benzene on the paper. So in order to get a big, a better picture of something out of the plane, it's not uncommon to kind of, instead of drawing it completely perpendicular to the paper, if this is the paper coming out at you, um, and not wanting to draw it completely in the plane, we do it somewhere in between, where we just pull down that top, see this side right here? I'm just gonna pull it down towards you just a bit so that you start to see that we're looking at it a little bit out of plane. To depict that in two dimensions, which we need to be able to do because we're be drawing things on paper, looking at things on screens, um, not always having a model kit ready or time to do that, right? So when you're doing homework and whatnot, you want to be able to kind of switch back and forth between two-dimensional thinking and three-dimensional. And so this two-dimensional representation is helpful for visualizing what happens when I just kind of tweak it out of the plane a little bit, so bring it towards you, <laughs> and uh, that's illustrated with this boldening of the front bond here. It's really extra dark to show that it's coming out, but just slightly. It's not perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the actual screen. So when we do that, that makes it easier for us to draw in those p orbitals that are above and below the plane. So this makes, whoops. I'm going to find all the pi bonds, and I'm going to show how we usually indicate a pi bond. Uh, we show an arc between them, p orbital overlap. Overlap. Notice it's side to side. So notice these sides, they kind of meld together if you look at one of those um, molecular orbital depictions. Overlap. They have to be parallel. Parallel p orbital overlap allows us to have a pi bond. I'm gonna do the bottom overlap in blue just because um, I want to be able to distinguish between it. So here's my blue that are overlapping below the plane. And then here's my red that are overlapping above the plane. But remember, Kekulé discovered that it's delocalized. There's resonance there. And we could see that. What do we know about resonance? So we can see that if we were to allow it to have resonance, that each and every one of those, the resonance hybrid, would have pi bond character everywhere. Because remember that we have, um, let's, draw, let's draw that out so we can draw the hybrid. We have this going on, which is the picture above. So we have ours down here, here, and here. And so the hybrid would look something like this. Every single sigma bond is accompanied by a neighboring dotted line to indicate that there's partial pi bond character at every single one. All right? So that's why we have the um, shortcut notation of the circle. It's not actually preferred use because we are doing mechanisms with reactions, so we like to actually show the pi bond doing things. Um, but I just, I'm throwing this in here so you're not confused if you see it, because these are the same. This means uh, the delocalized hybrid of these two. So it didn't matter which one you drew, and it doesn't because they're interchangeable. So when we have resonant structures, kind of keep those in brackets. Okay, so if that's the case, fully delocalized around all carbon atoms, then this is not accurate. This is showing them discreetly localized between each of these p orbitals. So to show that they're all delocalized, I'm going to connect them. So I have my blue in the hand, so I'll stay with blue. That means they can all, I have a blue donut, if you will, on the bottom, and I have a red donut on the top. And it's even sometimes referred to as kind of a donut of electron density. And that shows the delocalization. And these are, this is pi electron density above and below the plane. There's a nodal plane right between them. All p orbitals have that nodal plane, even when they uh, overlap. OK, so for three-dimensional sort of, hopefully that gives you a good sense of what we expect three-dimensionally. Before we dive into some of its properties, you might uh, enjoy watching a little bit of a take a little break with a, a little movie to show let's let's put it up here uh, I'm trying to find a clear spot 
How about we do this? There we go. Okay, so this is built in Spartan by me, so it's not really super high production quality, but it's just to give you an idea of what you can do in Spartan um, to visualize if you don't have your molecular model kit handy. The computer is really helpful. So notice how it's planar. We have the alternating pi bonds that are double. So double bond here, double bond there, and there's one over here. And I minimize the structure so the computer can uh, reach the ideal confirmation. If I ask it to show its electron density, so it's called electrostatic potential map, um, you can see it's actually really evenly distributed. So, you know, blue means it's cold, like less electron density, but we'll get into that um, a little more later. These are the orbitals. So I have the HOMO shown here, which HOMO means it's the highest occupied. So there's more nodes than the one I drew with the donut. That would be the first energy level. And we are going to get into that too, the molecular orbitals. That's that's a good little preview. This is the LUMO. So those are the two relevant. Those are frontier molecular orbitals. So that's the whole shebang with benzene. We're going to, I'll probably um, come back to that, no doubt, very soon. Before we get to the molecular orbitals, because it does kind of, it's going to be the answer to a lot of these questions. Uh, we're going to try to see how did we, why should we even suspect that we need to probe and look that deep? So what's interesting to see with benzene is we've been saying benzene's special, don't react it like the alkenes. But if you try to, you can eventually get it to do some of the same addition reactions that alkenes do. So let's take hydrogenation, for example. That's a very simple alkene reaction. So in other words, we take an alkene, we add hydrogen across the pi bond, and we get an alkane. And so we're going to start with cyclohexene, cyclohexadiene, and then cyclohexatriene, in other words, benzene, and see what the difference is when we try those. OK, so this is very similar to what we did with our conjugation section, um, comparing the reactivity differences between conjugated and not conjugated. Now we're going to work on whether it's aromatic or not. OK, so one alkene. So this is a monoalkene. So we, we see that the, that's our base value to work from. So if we're going to predict what a diene would be, then, and, and you know, granted this is conjugated. We should acknowledge that because that does make, we know that makes a difference. Um, so let's say, okay, without accepting that, that we know it's conjugated, we'll change about the value. Let's just do a quick calculation. Negative two, tw negative 28.6 kcals per mole times two because we have a diene. Okay, if you plug that in, negative 57.2 kcals per mole. Not a perfect match, but we know that conjugation will change predicted from experimental. So it's off by about, I'm gonna just approximate to keep our lives easier, about two kcals per mole. And I'll just say thanks to conjugation because we've made that conclusion before. Here comes the triene, conjugated as well. So if we were off by two, we should maybe, if it's linearly related, um, then we would, should be off by a little more, right? So uh, four kcals per mole. Let's see how far we're off. So the true value is negative 49.8 kcals per mole. Wait a minute. We already know that's going to be far off because we're going to multiply it by three and get a smaller number than when we multiply it by two. That's a big difference. Let's do it anyway. Three times negative 28.6 kcals per mole. That gives us negative 85.8 kcals per mole. Wow, we were very far off, very far off. So let's address that. I said very far off, but how far off? Let's, let's do a little comparison. Delta H, Theo, let's do the absolute value, just a difference. We're just looking at a difference. Theoretical delta H compared to the actual delta H, what was that difference? That's how far off we were. 36 kcals per mole. If 
this was simply a conjugated triene issue, like, oh, we had one more bond conjugated, then we should say, whoopee, we're going to be off by, so if we said conjugation is the reason, let's propose that. Conjugation is the reason. We know what conjugation does to this value because we showed that with the diene. It took us off by two kcals. So if we have two that are conjugated, took us off by two, three that are conjugated, let's say it would take us off by four kcals, right? But we were way off from that. So the delta H was off by more than four. I mean, look at that difference. Therefore, we can conclude that conjugation alone does not explain the stability. So you could see why they were scratching their head in the old days. Like this is a really big jump in stability. It's, it's very reluctant to give up those pi bonds. Why is that? Why are those pi bonds adding stability? So we know they're delocalized. So it must have something to do with the fact that they're in a ring. And so there's this um, new definition of conjugated systems in a ring. So we're not going to just call them conjugated. If they meet certain criteria, we're going to call them aromatic. And that is the uh, all aromatic systems have that uh, really surprising level of reactivity, which is not surprising anymore because we expect it from aromatic systems if we could predict they're aromatic. Not all ring systems are aromatic. Not all conjugated ring systems are aromatic. So we need to learn the rules on how to figure out when it's aromatic and therefore we'll have that uh, exceptional stability. So the definition of aromatic means that it's increasingly stabilized like we saw, almost like it's an anomaly. Um, due to delocalization of electrons, so each carbon or each atom, doesn't have to be carbon, it could be a header atom in the ring, um, is able to delocalize all of the pi electrons. So it doesn't miss any atoms. It's continuous. They have to be planar, otherwise you don't have the p orbitals to overlap. They would not delocalize if it wasn't planar. Those go hand in hand, but it's worth stating. Um, continuously adjacent, so no skipping, in other words, with a number of electrons following Huckel's rule. It usually has a little umlaut over there. There we go. Huckel's rule is a cyclic compound is considered aromatic when num its number of pi electrons equals 4n plus 2, where n is 0 or any positive integer. Another way to say this is an odd number of pi bonds. <laughs> so I'm going to say that. Uh, when we see an odd number of pi bonds, benzene has three odd. It follows Huckel's rule. Let's look at uh, let's look at Huckel's rule in both lights though, because the official definition, um, odd number of pi bonds, these translate to really one and the same. So let's let's look at Huckel's rule. It sounds like a mouthful, but let's apply it to benzene. Okay, we saw that benzene had delocalized electrons. We saw that it was planar. We really looked at that in detail. We know that. There's no skipping atoms. Each of the carbon atoms uses its p orbital, every single one of them. And now the only thing we haven't answered is does it follow this Huckel's rule 4n plus 2? So 4n plus 2 needs to equal the number of pi electrons that are delocalized in the ring. 2, 4, 6. 4n plus 2 equals 6 pi electrons for benzene. Can 4n plus 2 equal 6 and allow n to be a whole number? Yes, n equals 1. So therefore, it satisfies Huckel's rule. But there's a pattern with that. This equation really only works if you have an odd number of pi bonds. And we'll see that. We'll prove that with some other cases. Uh, 1, 2, no, oh, not that one. I'm just gonna redraw it. That's the shortest way to get to recover this issue. Okay, so one, two, three pi bonds in benzene. One, two, three. 
Uh, so that means we have 3 times 2, 6, 4n plus 2, right? Because 4n comes from a 2 times whatever, that is usually 2 electrons that are part of it, and then you add another one, so that's that extra pi bond. So that's, that's always going to give you an odd number of pi bonds. So work, take whatever angle of Huckel's rule works for you. We're going to work some examples, though, so, to, so hopefully you'll see what I mean. Okay, so this means it's aromatic. So how can we take that, <clears throat> that list of criteria, planar, continuous, uh, conjugated, and make sure that we are following Huckel's rule? Let's give it a try. There's a chart on the next page, kind of a little logic diagram, a little truth table. You're going to look for your, we could do this again with benzene to prove it passes the test. You're going to look for your, um, there's two tests that it has to pass to be aromatic. So you always ask this one first. Is there a ring with continuously delocalized p orbitals? No skipping atoms. That's what continuous means. They're all unadjacent. Continuously means no skipping. And delocalized, well, if they're delocalized, what are re what's required for, that means they're conjugated, essentially, right? What's required to be conjugated? Conjugated or overlapping. Either way, that means they are parallel in the same plane. That, that's inherent to that word, so there's a lot in there. You have to make sure that they could be planar, parallel, and you're not skipping any atoms. If that's true, congratulations, your molecule passes the test. It might be aromatic. Then we look for Huckel's rule. Count the number of pi electrons. So let's say we have four, two, and two. So four pi electrons total. Four n plus two will never equal four. So it would not be aromatic. That would be anti-aromatic. In fact, n equals one if we have four pi electrons. It actually established, follows the anti-aromatic rule. So it's called anti-aromatic, the opposite of aromatic. If it passed test number one, it's planar. The p orbitals can be perpendicular excuse me, uh, parallel and in the same plane. So they can all be delocalized. There's no skipping. All of that is, all of that is passed, yet the electron count is wrong, and it's anti-aromatic, the opposite of aromatic. If we didn't even pass the first test, so maybe it's for whatever reason, it might not be a ring, or it might not be conjugated, or we might have skipped, you know, if it's not conjugated, that means we probably skipped an atom. One of the atoms doesn't even use a p orbital. It fails the first test. It's not even considered. You, you don't waste your time counting electrons. It's not even considered for uh, the label anti-aromatic or aromatic. It goes straight to non-aromatic. Okay, so let's put that to this, these two tests to the tests with the next example. We're going to label, we're going to expand beyond benzene. There's a whole world out there of aromatic systems. So benzene is going to be our sort of favorite that we're used to. So we're going to add, but you know, just to kind of get used to using this test system, we're going to say, are there a continuously, a continuous supply of p orbitals on every atom in the ring? So p orbital, p orbital, p orbital, p orbital, p orbital, p orbital, yes. So what I might do is make a little list over here since we're going to do this problem so many times. Zoom this out, and I'll make a list right here. Uh, test one. So delocalized pi electrons. Test in a ring. And test two is 4n plus 2. Okay, so I'm going to start with benzene because we've, that's the easiest, we've already really established it. We know it passes the first test. Every single carbon atom is using a p orbital, it's delocalized, so we'd say, yep. So let's move on to that, the next one. 
number of pi electrons is six pi electrons, which can be equal to four n plus two. So yes, passes both tests. It is aromatic. Let's go to the one right before it, cyclobutadiene. The ring, we can assume, unless you're told otherwise, because you would have to build a model every time to know if it's planar or not. So um, that's the only way to have delocalization, remember, is if the ring is actually planar. So let's assume it's planar, or you will be told otherwise, because you don't, on paper, you can't see if it's planar or not. So let's assume it's planar, and we are going to go ahead and calculate um, the number of electrons in the ring. Actually, no, 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 that skips it. We're gonna do test one. We're going to make sure they're delocalized. Okay, every single carbon is using a p orbital. That means we can write a resonance structure for this. That means they're, in other words, they are conjugated. And because it's a ring, and it's so small, it has to be planar. Try to build this model, it's really hard um, because it's tight, can't rotate. So it's definitely planar. Um, in that case, it passes the first test. Planar ring delocalized pi electrons, meaning every carbon's using a p orbital. Okay, test number two, electron count. How many elect pi electrons are there? Two times two pi electrons equals four pi electrons. So each pi bond uses two pi electrons. So we have four pi electrons. That does not equal four n plus two. That equals four n. So this is not aromatic, but because we made it to the second test, we're gonna call it anti-aromatic. Okay, I am going to suggest you pause the video. Give these other two a try and check back later, okay? This is a good time to take a little break and pause and try this yourself and see if you can get the answers that I will reveal shortly.